that we're in a cultural emergency. The Conservatives have to stop talking about economics and start confronting uh, this cultural disaster that is unfolding. Um, the worst case scenario effectively is they eventually are able to win elections that openly woke governments. We see this a bit in Canada with Justin Trudeau's Liberal. Uh, openly woke governments are then going to be able to bring in censorship and a whole Orwellian uh, sort of structure of um, institutions, ministries of truth that are going to be able to sort of effectively end your career and your ability to have a livelihood, maybe even to, to bank and access public services. Today on British Thought Leaders, I sit down with Eric Kaufman, Professor of Politics at Birkbeck College, University of London. Professor Kaufman is a political scientist and author of numerous books examining the impact of changes in ideology and population on our identity and our politics. I'm Lee Hall and this is British Thought Leaders. Professor Eric Kaufman, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thanks for having me. Uh, you've recently released some research on the culture wars. I wonder if you could just start by telling us what you mean by the culture wars. Maybe also this term wokeness that's thrown around so much these days. Yeah, so really what we, what we mean today by the culture wars is, is effectively a, a battle between two ideologies, one of which I will call cultural socialism, and one which is called cultural liberalism. <clears throat> the cultural so what cultural socialism means is effectively equal outcomes for identity groups, historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups have to have equal outcomes. And if those outcomes are not equal, though, they have to be engineered even through illiberal policies. The second thing is preventing those marginalized groups uh, from harm, uh, from experiencing harm, including emotional harm of the most microscopic variety known as microaggressions. So that's cultural socialism. Cultural liberalism is sort of the traditional classical liberal belief system. Free speech, uh, due process, equal treatment, um, objective truth, scientific knowledge. So we've now got a, a clash between these two ideologies. Um, the old dominant classical liberalism is giving way in a lot of our institutions, particularly schools, universities, uh, but also increasingly in government agencies, corporations, and so on. Um, and this sort of tension is really heating up, and it comes, it breaks the surface, obviously, in things like uh, cancellations, people being fired uh, for legal speech. You know, the term wokeness, which is a sort of the religious accompaniment, if you like, to cultural socialism. And what wokeness means in a word is um, the sacralization, the making sacred of historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups. Once a group is seen as sacred, anything you do that is perceived as offending the totems, it's like offending the gods, uh, means that you can, you can be punished with absolute prejudice. So that means you're excommunicated. If you cross that red line and if you offend the gods, you are a target for a kind of witch burning. And so this, this is a sort of much more about sacred totems and profaning sacred totems. For example, if you argue against a, a program that's got the anti-racism label, the anti-fascism label on it, or the trans rights label on it, you must be a racist, a transphobe, etc. And you've therefore committed a violation of the, the sacred taboo, and you therefore must be cast out. Um, and so that wokeness is really the religious side of cultural socialism. Right. From my position as a, <laughs> a, a non-academic and a consumer of yeah. all sorts of media, I would have taken a guess that the public was very much leaning in, in favour of the kind of cultural leftist position. But your research shows something quite different. Yeah, very much. The public is, is most of the beliefs held by the American and British public, for example, and, and all Western publics. Um, is on the cultural liberal side. You know, people are in favor of free speech, due process, equal treatment. They're not in favor of racial preferences to engineer equal outcomes, for example. I mean, overwhelmingly, even, you know, groups that are supposedly the beneficiaries, like African Americans, Latino Americans, overwhelmingly oppose racial preferences. That's an example, really, of how unpopular these policies are. Um, 
generally I find a sort of two to one opposition to um, a woke stance. So a question like, um, you know, should J.K. Rowling be dropped by her publisher? Should uh, Winston Churchill's statue be moved from Parliament Square? You'll get at least a two to one opposition, if not more, in mm -hmm. the general public. Um, the sort of fly in the ointment is that amongst those 25 and under, it's more like one to one, so they're split evenly on a lot of these questions. And on some questions, they're actually on the woke side. So there's a big age gradation in the public opinion data, but overall the public leans overwhelmingly against uh, wokeness, against cultural socialism. So looking at these uh, issues that have been part of the culture wars over the last 10, 20 years, we've seen massive societal changes. A lot of uh, identity-based politics that we've imported, really, from the US. Do you think these kind of issues are uniting people or dividing people? I think they're very much dividing people. I think that's that's pretty clear. Um, I think what you've got, I mean, you had an earlier wave of cultural conflict, which is still continuing around, for example, the migration issue. Um, we saw the rise of um, national populism with Brexit, Trump, Le Pen, etc. cetera. Uh, what that then led to was a sort of progressive cultural socialist overreaction or acceleration uh, known as the Great Awakening. And we can chart, chart this very easily in a number of different ways through public opinion surveys um, and through the, the content of newspapers like the New York Times or the Guardian or, or even the Times. You see a huge surge in terms like white supremacy, systemic racism and so on really beginning in the mid 2010s. Um, and so yeah, what this then does is it um, leads to a process whereby one side reacts, the other side reacts against the other side reacting, and you're into this sort of uh, culture war, if you like. And we can really track that in the news, uh, newspapers, where both of these lines, the social justice terminology just spikes, and the anti-woke terminology spikes. And so that is sort of the, the, the conflict we're in. And of course, it filters into our politics, um, and it certainly uh, raises passions. You see shouting matches at school boards over the content of uh, schooling, uh, of education, what kids are being taught about sex, what they're being taught about gender, what they're being taught about race. That's now a political issue. Institutions which were never politicized now, uh, Stanford University, the law students cancel somebody, that makes news nationally. Um, and it layers on to the sort of existing uh, divides, maybe over Trump and over Brexit. On top of that, we now get another layer of moral outrage and reaction against that moral outrage. And so, yeah, it's just, it's oxygenating the culture war, oxygenating polarization. So, looking at the term, the culture wars, you would think we have these two kind of opposing camps and they're getting ready for battle. Yeah. But I think the way you describe the kind of the, the woke side is more like a, a social Marxist movement. So is it so much it's not a war, but more a, there's a revolution that's happening with, with the aim of destroying the existing culture? Yeah, absolutely right. I think what you've got is, is something similar in China with the Cultural Revolution. Uh, it's the same sort of process here, including, you know, with the Red Guards in China, that use of more bottom-up, self-organizing mob activity. That's something we very much see, uh, something I call emergent authoritarianism. So authoritarianism rising from activists who put pressure on administrators and institutions to clamp down on freedoms. Um, private censorship, pressuring Twitter and Facebook and others to censor. You know, that kind of bottom-up censorship is, is, is something that we see. It's a threat to the Enlightenment, to um, Western liberties, for example, very much. And you're right about this term, culture war. So uh, the reality is there's a cultural re revolution being pursued by progressive illiberals in our institutions like universities, uh, but increasingly through corporate uh, diversity and equity and uh, trainings and initiatives through um, you know, the same sort of uh, politicization of government civil service agencies. That sort of stealth campaign, that administrative bottom-up kind of uh, campaign is well in train. When people resist that and say, actually, uh, we don't think, uh, you know, teaching people that uh, they should feel guilty for their, the color of their skin because they look like somebody who may have committed a, uh, some sort of a, an infraction a hundred years ago. We don't think that's maybe a great way to go, especially since all the evidence shows 
you know, diversity training and, and, and all of this CRT teaching in schools is detrimental to the exact outcomes you're seeking. It leads to, uh, you know, for example, not being willing to criticize a black schoolmate or, or co-worker, meaning they don't get feedback, meaning they can't develop and succeed as, as well as, as white people. So it's, it's completely self-defeating. We know that from research, and yet they continue to pursue it. It's an ideological... Uh, symbolic virtue signaling crusade. Now, and this is why I do think culture wars is a bit disingenuous in the sense that that is a charge that is leveled by those on the progressive left that are seeking to shut down opposition to this revolution, right? So if a politician says, we've got to look at free speech in universities, oh, you're stoking the culture war. That's an in what that is trying to do is stop discussion, stop resistance, let us just continue with our cultural conquest in a way. Um, so yeah, I think it's very important to step away, see behind the use of that term, culture war, uh, and to see it as a tactic to try and defang opposition um, to this essentially mind virus that's sweeping through our institutions. You mentioned about the diversity training thing that I know you've done quite a bit of research yeah. into this. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so what happened uh, on a number of surveys I've conducted, what I've done is, first of all, ask people if they've attended diversity training. Um, and then, so you have a number of, many questions on the survey, and, and there are also questions on, um, you know, how fearful are you of getting punished, fired, shamed for speech? Um, how, how willing are you to criticize a black workmate, for example? And what you find is people who have attended diversity training, first of all, they tend to be slightly more, actually slightly more woke in their attitudes. So diversity training does actually seem to shift some people's attitudes. Um, but in addition, it sort of makes people a lot more fearful uh, of being punished for speech at work. Um, a very clear effect, especially in this country, people who are conservative or who voted for Brexit um, and who undergo diversity training are far more likely to fear job loss um, and reputational loss for speech uh, at work. So it, it increases fear, it increases awareness and uh, consciousness of race. People see race more. Um, and as a result of this, it leads people to be more fearful of interactions with uh, minority colleagues. And so, for example, there's a significant increase in uh, discomfort at criticizing a black coworker. Um, now, of course, feedback is a key way in which workers can uh, address their mistakes, improve, get, find out how they can get promoted. So this is having a, a, a negative effect on the exact groups that the social justice left is claiming it wants to help. Uh, and what that seems to do is it only reinforces the lack of progress of these groups, which then reinforces the narrative of quote-unquote systemic racism. So the whole thing is really a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, yeah, extremely negative in terms of workplace uh, relations, extremely negative in terms of uh, the progress of minorities. It's just, and, and, and they will admit this, they, they will admit that there's no evidence that any diversity training works, and yet the pressure coming from activists is, what are you doing to, you know, address equity and diversity, you just have to do it because otherwise you're some sort of a, a racist, right? Then this is the way, the way in which this, this is packaged is that this thing is called anti-racism and if you oppose it, you must be a racist. And it's very clever. So it means that people are unwilling to unmask this thing and push back against it for fear of becoming radioactive to others. Mm. So uh, your research suggests that um, if the Conservative Party were to advance their conservative values a bit further, it would actually get them quite a bit of support. Mm. Why do they seem so cautious to do that? Yeah, I mean, this is what's really interesting, is you look at the public opinion data. <clears throat> These culture war issues, they split the left. So an issue like, should J.K. Rowling be dropped by her publisher? You know, this really splits the left, unites the right. Um, it's, a, it's a perfect wedge issue for any party seeking to increase its support. The, what the Conservatives should be doing is putting the Labour Party on the back foot over trans, over critical race theory teaching in schools, over is Britain a racist country. All of these things, they should be going after Labour, forcing them to choose. Do they please their activists? or do they tack to where the center of public opinion is in the country? Uh, and this is what the Republicans are doing increasingly in the U.S. People like Ron DeSantis 
in Florida, Glenn Youngkin in Virginia and so forth, very effectively raising this issue about what's being taught in schools. The Tories are running shy about this. Why are they running shy? It's because of a number of reasons. One is the composition of the Conservative Party, the MPs, they tend to be business liberals who are uh, liberal, or sort of conservative on economics, liberal on cultural issues, with some exceptions. So they're not really interested. That's the first issue. Secondly, they are petrified of being called racist or transphobic or, or some other phobic. Um, they don't have the stomach, with again, ex some exceptions, such as uh, Kemi Badenoch or Suella Braverman or others. There are some exceptions, but by and large, many of them want, I won't say a quiet life, but they want to be uh, you know, accepted at dinner parties in Westminster. They, they don't want to be attacked by the media. Um, but in fact, the problem is that to actually go after this stuff, I mean, the Labour Party doesn't have to do anything. All they have to do is nothing, and their fellow travellers in the institutions will carry out this cultural revolution. Their only job is to try and deflect, to say this is divisive, stoking a culture war, to shut down any government action on this. So it falls to the Conservatives to elevate these issues and also to, to raise awareness in the public who don't always know what's going on. Um, and so, yes, you've got to take the brickbats. You've got to be willing to be accused of being a racist and to say, no, actually what your the policy you're calling anti-racism is actually reverse racism against white people or, or you know, the policy you're calling anti-trans is actually very anti-female. You've got to be willing to actually call their bluff, take the hit, and that way you change public opinion, you raise public awareness. And the Conservative Party has largely failed at this. They've been unwilling um, to raise cultural issues because their comfort zone is just talking about the economy. That's the sandbox the media will allow the right to play and they, they won't allow the, the right to go onto the cultural terrain, which is really what actually distinguishes uh, right from left. I mean, nowadays there's very little difference economically, but on the cultural issues, um, the Conservatives have just been um, really timid. Uh, either they're not, they're not interested or they're timid, and so they're not serving the public particularly well. You've mentioned several times about this kind of need to put your head above the parapet, that some mm. people will, will need to do that. Do you think we're reaching a point where people are, 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 are starting to do that in this country and it's becoming more, more commonplace? I don't know is the honest answer. I still think most people in institutions are reluctant to do this. Um, although what I will say is my own research would suggest that the problem is mostly ideological and has not got, it has less to do with a spiral of silence where everybody's unwilling to speak up. So for example, support for, uh, you know, a diversity pledge where you pledge to advance diversity and equity. Now that's compelled speech. It's a political loyalty oath. It is deeply illiberal. And yet you'll get 50% of, of, of people saying, yeah, well, that sounds nice. I mean, we're helping, we're helping the disadvantaged, aren't we? So I have to be in favor of that. People aren't actually thinking about, okay, well, what, what happens to somebody who doesn't want to pledge allegiance, right? And they'll say, well, okay, that person should be either pressured or disciplined. Yeah, but what does that, what does that mean? You're now pressuring or disciplining somebody for speech. So there's a sort of illiberalism baked into a lot of the sort of fine-sounding policies, such as affirmative action or such as um, diversity statements or diversity training that people don't see or they choose to ignore. Um, so I think the bigger problem is much more ideological, that these woke beliefs come packaged in this nice liberal-sounding rhetoric. How can you be against diversity? How can you be against anti-fascism? Um, of course you can't be. Even equity. People don't really know what that word means. It's kind of Orwellian manipulation of the meaning of words. So, I, I mean, I think this is sort of one, one big problem. I think that you know, people are, I, I should say that the internet is a space that is more freewheeling. Podcasts, shows such as this, do allow for a counter-narrative to what's being pushed in the institution. So people who are online, and, and fortunately, I guess people are increasingly getting their, their, their news content, their, their uh, cultural consumption online, that does allow for a different view. Um, that's positive, but whether people are, and, and there are organizations like the Free Speech Union, which are providing pro bono legal help uh, to people who want to take cases against their employers. Counterweight is another organization that's doing this. That is helping to move the needle, I think. 
Um, but I still think most people are probably not going to take the chance to risk, uh, you know, if not losing their job, losing promotion opportunities, being seen as not a team player. Uh, there are all kinds of subtle social pressures that can be brought to bear on people. And even if it doesn't mean you're going to lose your job, you may not want to be ostracized. You may not want to pe have people whispering about you at work or, or being wary about you. And, and, and these kinds of social pressures are very effective at ensuring conformity and orthodoxy in organizations. Cass Sunstein, the American legal scholar, uh, writes very much about this. The more um, a, a company or an organization has a social dimension where people socialize after work or at lunch, the more powerful conformity is, the less dissent and viewpoint diversity is tolerated. Um, and, and, and so I think part of the, the problem here is that most a lot of people are in collegial workplace situations where uh, team building is, is part of the process, and so they're going to be reluctant, really, to, to break ranks. I'm hoping we can focus a bit on age. I know you've done a lot mm. of research in this area. Uh, young people generally have always been kind of left. But is the Overton window for the younger people shifting somewhat further to the left? And, and what being left means to them is kind of changing. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much in that question, right? And I think the first thing we can see is politically where Britain between the sort of youngest age bracket, the 18 to 25s and the 65 pluses, we've now got 40 points difference in willingness to vote for the Conservative Party, for example, or willingness to vote for Labour is the flip side. Um, now, that gap is, is bigger in Britain than it is, say, in the US, where it's about a 20-point gap, and in Canada, where it's barely a gap at all, about zero. So there is something distinct about Britain, which has to do, I think, more with the Brexit vote and its aftermath. But still, I think we're seeing, if you get away from voting to public opinion, uh, on these questions that pit cultural socialism against cultural liberalism, there we really see a generational divide. So uh, if you take a question like, should uh, J.K. Rowling be dropped by her publishers, uh, 18 to 25 is 50-50. 50 plus population, it's sort of 85% no, 5% yes. You know, the difference is between the generations is massive on this question. Should James Damore, the Google programmer, have been fired for um, scientifically valid internal memo on the firm's gender policy? Uh, young people, you know, two thirds say yes. They're backing this big corporation against an employee. I mean, that kind of tells you something. Uh, so it does. It's not about big versus small. It's about weighing in on behalf of anything that is touches on these sacred values around historically marginalized race, gender, sexual minorities. All you have to do is touch that uh, rail, and in instantly you get a lot of uh, young people just gravitating to the cultural socialist position because they've essentially been socialized in school, social media, celebrity culture, pop culture athletes, etc., have all been all in on, uh, you know, LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter, uh, Me Too movement, which of course has, there's some good things to these movements, but there's excesses, right? And there's no guardrails on how far they go. Um, and so what I'd say is um, the young people very much are in the vanguard of this, you know, along with those with, who are working in university and the culture sector. They're kind of at the, the leading edge of this revolution, mm -hmm. uh, and which is often the case that young people and students, again, the cultural revolution in China, we saw that as well, uh, they tend to be most taken in by utopian movements, uh, idealistic movements. But I think there is still also a, an evolution of opinion over time. So one of the things that used to be true about younger people is they were cultural relativists. So they would sort of say, well, there's no fixed right or wrong. Uh, there's just competing values. And so, and this was in the context of, for example, uh, you know, religion and, and uh, sort of traditional sexual propriety. So this idea of, of relativism was really what the 60s hippies were about. And that, that was sort of a characteristic of uh, young people. And that begins to change as we get into the sort of 2000, 2010s in particular. The shift goes from no, there's no absolute right or wrong to yes, there is absolute right or wrong. And actually, young people and the highly educated are now more likely to have that absolutist view about moral, uh, morality than older people. 
which is an inversion. So they're now left, but they're morally absolutist left instead of morally relativist left. So they're much less tolerant. So that growing liberal intolerance, uh, sorry, not liberal, leftist intolerance is rising in the young population. And so that's why we're getting these clashes with classical liberal values like free speech toleration. Suddenly, no, zero toleration is the new mantra. Um, and yeah, so that is a, a change and also explains, I think, some of the um, partisan splits. So, they, so for example, in the US case, white left-leaning young people are uh, almost almost one in two white left young, young uh, left leaning young per people are uh, agree with the statement people who disagree with me politically are immoral mm -hmm. so this moralization of politics this oh you're not just a republican or a, or a tory you're a, a racist and a transphobe and therefore you're an immoral human being i mean that kind of very black and white way of viewing the world is is increasing in the younger generation so is this going back to how you described wokeness as the religion, that the, right. the young people are much more kind of in tune with, with the religious nature of it, or at least the, the, yeah. their actions are? Yeah, I mean, they seem to have... Now, I don't want to generalise too much. There's another big divide amongst young people, which is between young men and young women, mm -hmm. which is arguably as big or bigger a divide as the divide between young people and older people. So. This is very much concentrated in the young female population and amongst young people who identify with as, as LGBT, which is as much as 25 or 30 percent of 18 to 25s if we look at surveys. Now, I, I know in the census that share is lower, but in the surveys it, it's quite high. So you get these groups that are imbibed in a culture of fragility and victimhood and more likely to identify as a victim. Um, that's part of what's going on, is that cultural fragility has very much been of, of sort of uh, therapeutic, what I would call therapeutic totalitarianism after, I think Rod Dreher or somebody came up with that, but mm -hmm. that value set is, is much stronger. Uh, the kind of cry-bully kind of set of values is, is much stronger, but it's definitely a, focused more on young women than young men. Um, um, so yeah, I think um, that really suggests that, you know, we're going to start to see, as these people enter uh, the workforce, and we've already seen that. Um, you saw what happened at the New York Times when they published Tom Cotton's editorial uh, on, you know, that, that, that the, the army should be used to quell the BLM riots. Um, so you have this kind of gr phenomenon of employee revolts at publishers and newspapers and other, you know, corporations, uh, which is because they're bringing that very black and white moralistic mindset with them into the workplace. It's not that they reach work and suddenly drop some kind of obsession or enthusiasm they had as a radical student and become like everybody else. No, they're actually trying to change and successfully are changing organizations they enter into. Uh, I mean, there was this classic saying, it's been attributed to various people over the years, I think Churchill, yeah. um, the King of Sweden at some point maybe, but the same being, when you're young, if you're not liberal, you don't have a heart. Right. And when you hit your mid-30s, <laughs> if you're not conservative, you don't have a brain. Uh, are the young people now still following this kind of movement from left to right in the well, same way? I think I would expect that they, there will be some of that. Um, but it depends on what we're looking at. I mean, it is well established that in terms of voting behaviour in Britain or the US, people shift about 20 points to the right between age... 18 and age 65 something or age 20 and age 65 so there is that that's an established shift now John Byrne Murdoch of the FT claims that we're now in a new paradigm where that shift isn't happening amongst Millennials anymore and I think he could be right um, the other thing is you can look at other indicators so for example religion there was you know you could certainly see how uh, religious observance was much lower amongst young people than older people and people maintained that as they went through life. And so the population as a whole became less religious. So there we didn't see a shift back towards something called conservatism uh, as people grew older. So I think we need to be open to, and I think it's more likely on a lot of these cultural questions, you know, even something like acceptance of gay marriage or, or you know, you, you definitely see that these things start with younger people, but those younger people 
to some degree, values crystallize in your 20s, and you take that with you through life, so you get cohort replacement. Uh, and, and a lot of change happens through that cohort replacement or generational turnover. Uh, older people with a previous set of values die off. Younger people form the median voter, a bigger part of the population. Uh, and so, for example, that was true about attitudes towards homosexuality. It was true about attitudes towards religion. That was less true about certain other attitudes, like, such as immigration or Europe. But it's not. what I would say is, I don't think we should assume that these young people are going to become conservative. Now, already, by the way, I should say, on economic questions, they're already relatively conservative. They're not, young people are not radical on economic issues at all. It's the cultural issues, immigration plus these culture war issues where they really stand out. And I think that has the potential. They have the potential to carry those attitudes with them through life the way they carried Previous generations of young people carried attitudes towards, let us say, more liberal attitudes towards homosexuality, towards religion through life. And so I, my view is actually that wokeness, we're only at the beginning, and that generational turnover is going to drive an increase and in penetration uh, of wokeness into our institutions, into our electorate. Uh, because I don't think they're going to drop those beliefs easily. They've grown up with them. I think they've crystallized. I think young people are. Now, um, the research I've done would suggest that while they're in high school and even undergraduates at university, their opinions are somewhat malleable. You could have them read a passage about free speech and shift their opinions in favor of free speech and against emotional safety by as much as 10 or 15 percentage points. For reading a paragraph, that's pretty, pretty effective. Um, but once they are beyond that, there's no really reaching people. And, and so I, I sort of think that this generation has been socialized in these values. I think they're going to carry them with them uh, as they become the median voter. And so I'm quite worried that society as a whole is going to move very much in an illiberal uh, direction, uh, certainly 20 years out. And what is it that, that drove the young people to be um, socialized in this way? Is it like school? Is it social media? Well, I think the dominant uh, influence is online, so through social media and the newer partisan clickbait media which emerges in the mid-2010s as the result of sh numerous shakeups in the uh, media industry including the loss of classified ads, the closing down of local news, um, and, and the rise of the internet. All of these things kind of lead to um, lead to more partisan media uh, ecosystem and young people get their media heavily through online um, and, and through newer news sources. So between social media influence and online clickbait news, that's sort of a major factor. Also, celebrities, um, motion pictures, music, athletes, most of them are uh, tend to be woke, or at least the ones who are vocal. Uh, so they are also an influence uh, as well on the youth culture. Um, that's the major force, but all of this is being reinforced by the schools. Increasingly, um, the schools are, are at the forefront of this. It's, it's, I found in, in research I'd done that three in four um, young people aged 18 to 20 said they were taught at least one critical social justice concept like white privilege, uh, patriarchy, many genders. You know, one in, sorry, this is three in four British uh, young people were taught this at school. In the U.S., it's, it's 93 percent, almost all. Um, in the U.S., what we really saw in, in, this is in a recent Manhattan Institute report that Zach Goldberg and I published, what we saw is that the people who got exposed to a higher dose of critical social justice concepts at school were far more likely to shift to the left um, and to endorse policies like affirmative action, you know, racial preferences for blacks, um, white guilt. Uh, you know, much more likely to endorse white privilege, systemic race, all these concepts, these radical, unscientific, almost conspiratorial concepts are being endorsed by uh, pupils who've had a higher dose of them. So this indoctrination really works. And schools really do matter. They're playing a role. Um, the data for the UK showed an effect. It wasn't, I didn't have quite as many questions as I would have liked to test this. Uh, it doesn't seem to be as big an impact as in the US. Uh, but still, schools are very much a part of this, and they are indoctrinating blatantly. They're breaking the law in Britain. Again, the Tories have been 
uh, either too shy or too, uh, too timid, uh, or in many cases too, I won't say stupid, but that's kind of the way it is. I mean, they have the, the kind of guidance that's provided against to schools uh, is weak. It's, it's full of loopholes. Uh, there's just no seriousness in tackling what I think is a major issue because these institutions are training up the next generation of voters and they are indoctrinating them to be reflexively anti-conservative, to see um, the right as, as, as morally deficient. Uh, and they're being in inducted into these cultural socialist values. And until the conservatives get serious about this, they are, essentially they are signing away um, their electoral prospects for, you know, for the future, especially 20 years out. Britain, I have argued, is going to look more like Canada, where the median voter and the natural party of government is on the left, and, and only occasionally does the right come into power. But these young people who are being indoctrinated have access to counter-arguments, or, or do ones with opposing views even feel comfortable to share them, do you think? Well, they definitely don't feel comfortable sharing them in, in school, and we, we know that, um, you know, that, and those who are on the right are, are very reluctant to yeah. express their, their true beliefs. I mean, even in the general public, I mean, the number of people, I think it's like 85% of um, Brexit voters, conservative voters in this country, I, I don't know if that's the exact number, but say that they are, um, you know, they would be reluctant to express their true beliefs. Um, uh, you know, so, so there is a, a general uh, sort of self-censorship occurring, particularly amongst dissenters from the dominant orthodoxy. Um, in schools, um, and, and you know, however, it is also the case that there are alternative arguments that young people can find online, and particularly younger men are are finding and expressing that. I mean, you one of the things you notice in any survey that comes out of schools is how big the gender gap is um, on, on all these questions. It's quite staggering. You see it in elite, these highly woke elite private schools uh, from the U.S. and over there. There was a survey that came out uh, that had been conducted by the school itself, and you could see this big gender split. Um, sp partly what's occurring is that women are more likely to uh, fall in behind established um, moralities, established orthodoxies. There's, there's good to that. You need to have cohesion in a society, and so women will tend to reinforce the existing uh, dominant value system. Men are more likely to be contrarians. So yeah, I, but I think we are seeing that the internet is the key source of resistance, the, the key source of counterculture, uh, and, and particularly these very popular um, you know, big podcasts like Joe Rogan and, and Jordan Peterson and Trigonometry, etc., but also a whole host of mid-level uh, content such as this show, such as New Culture Forum and, and many others are providing, you know, they are absolutely vital, I think, in providing resistance to the dominant narrative. Uh, they are making a difference, um, but it's more going to be those sort of risk-taking, contrarian, mainly male young people that are going to be willing to defy convention. Looking at the things we've discussed the last 20 years, yeah. cancel culture, uh, ideologies and education changing. If you go into futurist mode now and think about 20 years into the future, how can we expect things to be and to kind of give us a worst case scenario and maybe a best case scenario to end well, on high? <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, people who say that um, Wokeness has peaked, it's fading. You know, you can look at indicators such as uh, the number of people cancelled, uh, the content of newspapers, you know, the, the number of newspapers that are talking about white supremacy and racism. You know, yes, that peaked around 2020, 2021. George Floyd, post George Floyd, it's come down a little bit. It's now sort of where it was in the sort of mid 2010s. Still highly elevated. There are people saying, oh, well, this, this is over. It's going to. I don't buy that at all, and, and again, as I've mentioned, the reason is because young people have been imbued with cultural socialism. They're entering organizations. They will be the median voter. Now, it is true, because of the aging population and falling birth rates, it's going to take longer for those young people to dominate the electorate, but eventually they will. Uh, their views will eventually dominate in 20, maybe it'll be 25 years. Um, but once that, had, well before that, they, you know, th these groups punch well above their weight in organizations, again, because they wrap their illiberal beliefs in a liberal coding that says diversity, 
uh, equity, et cetera, and how can you be against that unless you're a racist? Uh, and so they punch well above their weight in organizations. So I think they're going to move organizations first, and then they're going to move elections eventually. And once that happens, this is why I say we're in a cultural emergency. The conservatives have to stop talking about economics and start confronting uh, this cultural disaster that is unfolding. Um, the worst case scenario effectively is they eventually are able to win elections that n openly woke governments. We see this a bit in Canada with Justin Trudeau's liberal. Uh, openly woke governments are then going to be able to bring in censorship and a whole Orwellian uh, sort of structure of um, institutions, ministries of truth that are going to be able to sort of effectively end your career and your ability to have a livelihood, maybe even to, to bank and access public services. Um, it's, it's a version of China's social credit system where you will be uh, effectively blacklisted um, under, under this sort of new regime. Now, in Canada, it would operate through these uh, kangaroo courts called human rights tribunals, which already exist. You already must attend if you are dragged into one of these human rights tribunals. You, you must attend. You must pay tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees, and they can drag you through these for months and months and months, even if there's nothing there. So it may be, I can, I can foresee the day where if you tweet, if you say that trans women aren't women, or a woman is an adult human female or something, you could wind up ultimately going to jail. And, and that is sort of the kind of Orwellian end state that I would see as a potential. And, and I think Canada is pushing that right now. Um, and, and so that is probably the worst case scenario. What is the best case scenario? Uh, the best case scenario would be we get some kind of a shift uh, eventually, either in younger generations or some of these young people eventually come to their senses and realize that actually um, the, the sort of downsides to cultural socialism are just so much greater uh, than their upsides. And the evidence is, is just overwhelming that this is uh, really going to to, to put a stop to sort of Western uh, freedoms and all the things that made life great in the West, uh, the Enlightenment values, it, it's, it's really endangering liberal democracy and will eventually wake up. And I mean, that's a hope of mine. I'm not sure it's going to happen. Um, and eventually the bulk of the population wakes up to um, the threat that cultural socialism poses and actually gets serious about tackling it, tackling the institutions that are indoctrinating uh, young people and, and essentially capturing society from below. So that would be my hope. Um, I think if you look to the US, especially to Ron DeSantis, I think that's sort of the most hopeful sign anywhere in the West that, that a politician is serious about this, is going to take steps to crack down on it in universities and schools, is going to elevate the salience, the importance of these in issues for the voting public, is going to force the other party uh, to admit that it supports this, that its activists are in favor of this, and to unmask. You've know, you got to pull the mask over the fine-sounding phrases. Oh, this is just sensitivity training. This is just about fairness for minority groups. All of that nonsense uh, has to be aggressively unmasked. People have to realize that these people are going after your liberty, your freedoms, your most fundamental freedoms, and that this has knock-on effects. It means we can't have discussions uh, you know, well-informed discussions about crime, about immigration, about homelessness, about health care. All these issues are essentially going to be paralyzed, are already being paralyzed by orthodoxies, which don't allow us to get at what are the genuine root causes of these problems. So it's not just, I mean, you may not care about freedom. You may not care about being able to speak freely. Uh, but even if you don't care about that, you've got to care about the effectiveness of education, of health care, of homelessness, policy of crime, you know, those are more basic. Uh, and all of those things are, are damaged, really, by um, the advance of this ideology. Professor Harry Kaufman, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thanks for having me.